Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee for joining us online. We are so excited to be here back in the worship center, and we're thankful that you've decided to join us this morning. We want to connect with you, and so we are encouraging you to fill out the digital connection card. This gives us the opportunity to know how we can be praying for you, praising God with you, and any other way that we can follow up with you. You can access this link by clicking the link below or by going to our website at chapelhillcc.church. Before we begin our service, let me read to you from Psalm 57. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth.
God is faithful and he never breaks his promises. We know this because we see time and time again in scripture that he makes a promise to his people and he always follows through on that promise. This week, we asked a few of you to share a a scripture verse that has been encouraging you in this time. And we wanted to share that with you all this morning and hear how God is giving our people hope. Hear these promises from our God. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Set your minds on things that are above not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace in every way. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Those promises we just heard have been true for generations, and they continue to be true for us today. As we continue to worship this morning, I encourage you to praise God for his faithfulness in the past, how he is being, pre- how he's being faithful now, and how he will continue to be faithful in the future. Let's sing together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You're here. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when we don't see you working. Even when we don't feel you working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop. Keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Jesus, you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's pray together, church. Almighty God, we have been reminded this morning of your faithfulness. Through your word, we know that all of the promises you speak are fulfilled. You remain the ruler of all. You are constant in the midst of storms. And you are continuing your work of bringing your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We confess that sometimes worry, doubt, and fear consume us and cause us to forget the promises you've made to us. We're sorry for the ways we haven't loved you or others well this week. We remember that your grace and mercy abound, and so we return to you this morning, God, knowing that you are with us and that you long for your people to know how deep and how high your love is. Thank you for the gift of time that you've given many of us in this season. We've had time with family, had more time to spend with you, and more time to rest. We're thankful for life, for health, for your church, and for your presence with us always. And now, God, we pray that as you have been faithful to us, we would be faithful to you. We pray that we would be faithful with our time, that we would spend time with you, growing closer to you than ever before. We pray that we would be faithful in our love and care for those around us. May we be your hands and feet, Lord, all the time, but especially now. We pray for health in our county, in our nation, and around the world. We think of the missionaries we support and pray specifically for the Gentiles in Italy and the Morses in Thailand. We pray for health and safety for them and that they would have opportunities to share your love and hope with those around them during this time. Faithful God, we thank you for the promise of your presence, and we find joy and hope in who you are this morning. We pray that we would share your love and joy with those around us. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised as the fiery trials you are going through, as if something were strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Entrust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. This is God's word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. One of my favorite songs is that of Blessed Be Your Name. That song was written by Matt Redman and his wife. 
Now, it was written just a few weeks after 9-11, and so Matt Redmond has been asked oftentimes when people hear this song, was there something that triggered the writing of that song? And he always responds the same way, saying that there really wasn't one event that spurred that song on. He said it had to do more with that of the whole of life, a realization that all we face, we all are going to face seasons of pain and seasons of unease. I know some people right now who are going through seasons of pain. You probably do too. Seasons of pain physically, seasons of pain relationally. Maybe you know several people who are going through the seasons of pain financially. But when I think about the season of unease, that's something all of us can identify with. We're not sure what's happening next. I mean, I really don't want to wear a mask the rest of my life. I don't know about you. I want to go to a baseball game this summer and be able to sit beside the person I want to sit by and watch the game. It's kind of a time of unease. And there have been a lot of moments like that in life, especially back in the first century, especially to those people that Peter was writing to in the book of First Peter, chapter 4. We're going to be looking at today, verses 12 through 19. He was speaking to people who were going through trials, who were going through suffering of of various types and people that were very uneasy as to what was coming next. And I hope that you'll hear Peter's words because I believe he gives us hope in the midst of trials. Let's look at verse 12 as we begin. Peter writes, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Peter reminds us from the get-go that, hey, uh, trials, suffering, just come to expect that. It's going to be just a part of life. When, when I think about things to expect, I think about a good friend of mine. When we were in high school together, he was always coming up with some side job. And so he decided he would be one of these people who would go to people's homes and he would get the bees, you know, out of their attics or out of, the, you know, out of their walls or whatever. And so he would call me and say, hey, why don't you help me? I'm going to go to such and such place. Can you help? And I'm like, oh, okay. So we would get there, and he would suit up with his overalls, and he had this hood like he put on. It had a, had a screening, and then he'd say, okay, come with me. He'd like, where's my outfit, you know? And so I would go, and I would bring these tools that he would need, and he would go into the room, and he'd say, yeah, come on, you can get closer. What I came to expect, I got stung every time I went with this guy. I only did it twice. It was like no more of that. Peter's saying, expect this. Don't be surprised by it. You're going to have trials. You're going to, have, you're going to go through suffering. And the thing is, some of us do. Especially think about physically. When we get older and maybe have contracted some kind of disease or something, it's no fun. But people get to a point in life knowing, yeah, this is probably how I'm going to exit this world. That's not a surprise. But then there are sometimes people who are just blindsided. By trials. That person who thinks they have a healthy, strong marriage and all of a sudden their spouse is coming to them saying, I don't love you anymore. I, I want a divorce. I mean, it's in those moments that our, our faith is really, really tested. Um, when those trials hit us like that, just out of the blue. Recently, I spoke to a friend of mine uh, that many years ago now uh, spent some time in a jail. And uh, I began to ask him what that experience was like. And he said, you know, the first couple of days, I was just scared to death. And then after he got over that a little bit, he said, then I began doing certain things over and over every day. And those certain things included walking in an area outside where he could walk. And then those other things were prayer and reading God's word. And he said, you know, in 30 days, in 30 days, you can read the entire Bible. I did that. I know. You know, when things seem incredibly hard and we're in a situation that we never once thought we would ever be in, those things that (laughs) used to seem so important to us, they don't matter, do they, anymore? Because we're up against it and we go to the one that we know we can go to, the one that can encourage us, the one who can help us, the one who gives us hope. And so we turn to God and we turn there because he is sovereign, he knows, and he has a plan for us and he gives us hope beyond what we're experiencing just in those, in those moments or in those days. So we should expect trials to come our way. And Peter goes on, he says, trials help us 
that they bring maturity. And we're going to look today in 1 Peter 4, but also in James chapter 1, as James speaks into this as well. So I want to read from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, Consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your, your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may grow up or that you may mature. So we experience trials so that we can grow, so that we can be complete, so that we can be mature. A a man found a cocoon of an imperial moth and decided that he would take that home so that he could watch the transformation of this moth. And one day, a small opening appeared, and for several hours, the moth was struggling to um, get through and, and move in the process forward. And so this man decided that he would help help the moth because he realized something has to be wrong here. So this man took some scissors, and he began to snip uh, a, a around a, a part of the cocoon. And this moth then easily was able to emerge. Its body was large and it was swollen, uh, and the wings uh, were small and they were uh, shriveled. And this man expected that in the next few hours that the wings would, well, they would spread out in their natural beauty. It didn't happen. (laughs) It didn't happen. Because instead of developing into this creature that would, we would think of would be free to fly, the moth spent its life dragging around a swollen body and shriveled wings. You see, the constricting cocoon and the struggle necessary to pass through the tiny opening are God's way. God's way of forcing fluid from the body into the wings of that creature. So we could say it this way, the, quote, merciful snip was in reality very cruel. I want you to think about those times in your life, maybe, maybe it has to be years before we realize it, but there are sometimes trials were exactly what we needed, and we grew from that experience. Probably not in those moments. <laughs> it's taking some time, but we grow and we mature from those things. So the question can be, okay, we, we know we're going to have trials in this life. We're going to go through times of suffering. So how should we react in these times of trials? Well, as we've said already, don't be surprised by them. There is something about being prepared, being ready in expectation for expecting these to come in our, in our lives. Then when they come, we won't be freaking out. We'll take them more in stride. We should know as Christians today that this is part of it. I mean, Jesus talked about if you follow me and become like me, people aren't going to like you. Um, Paul talked about it in 2 Timothy that we're going to suffer for you know, we're going to be persecuted because of our faith. So it's something that shouldn't surprise us. On top of that, when we react to trials, we should also react this way, that we keep on rejoicing in the midst of those things. First Peter 4 verse 13 says, But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I, I know, I get it. I know what you're thinking. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm supposed to get jazzed up. I'm supposed to be excited about going through trials and and, and suffering. I mean, what is the deal? Well, the deal isn't here that Peter's saying that, yay, (laughs) I'm suffering. That's not really what he's saying. But through those sufferings, through those trials that we go through, we are drawn closer to God, maybe closer to him than any other time. And it can be a great, great thing. I want to tell you a little bit about my special special friend. Um, he, uh, early in his marriage, had some struggles with not only physical issues, but also mental issues. He dealt with bipolar and he dealt with depression. And one of the ways that he decided that he could cope best with those things was through alcohol. And so one particular night, he was having a really tough time, and he called his Bible study leader. This man came over to be with him, and they spent hours talking, talking, praying, praying, uh, when together they decided it was time. And they took all of this man's hard liquor that he had in the house and they poured it down the drain. Now, my friend was a believer. He was a Christ follower, but he really wasn't living it. But he would tell you from that moment that night on, his life completely changed. 
his, um, his relationship with Christ just grew by leaps and bounds after that evening. His, his faith was just invigorated after that moment. And so for a time, he did well. In every way, especially spiritually, he was growing in, in that way. But he was also doing better in what he did for a living, growing his clients, and um, it was going well. But then again, the bipolar and depression kind of overtook him. And he found himself going from job to job to job. And because of that, he found himself in deep depression. During that time of going into deep depression, his health began to decline. And it was about that time that he moved, and he moved to Kokomo, Indiana. Coming to Kokomo, his faith took off. Uh, he was growing in Christ, and it was very evident uh, because if he was around people, he was sharing uh, Jesus. He was sharing his faith with others. And so here's a man who was growing spiritually. He is thriving when all of a sudden his health begins to decline again. Uh, this time, it's more of a physical issue. He began having tremors. And these uh, tremors began to get more uh, severe in nature. Those tremors that he had would remind you of something like that of Parkinson's, but it wasn't Parkinson's. It was, it, was, it was more than that. What I can tell you is if you knew my friend, if you knew him, he would tell you that my faith grew most after I got my disease. Often, he would quote Philippians 4 when it says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And as soon as he would quote that verse, he would always say the same thing. Now, that doesn't mean I can do everything like throw a baseball or throw a football, but it means I can do everything according to God's will. I'll never for forget the day that it looked, he looked at me and he said it this way. He said, it's such a wonderful feeling to know now that God is guiding my every step. I don't know of a man that I've known as well as him that had, has had to go through as many trials as he went through. I, I, I just, he had so much to bear. And yet, his life was transformed because of the trials that he underwent in his life. And all of a sudden, he was having great, great opportunities to share Jesus with others. You see, in James he tells us in James 1, 12 this, that when we endure trials, that not only it's good for us and we grow more mature, but we even gain a reward. He says it this way, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I believe that trials led my friend to a deeper relationship and a closer relationship with Christ and I know because of that, someday he's going to receive a crown of life in heaven. So we have these things in life called trials, and we go through times of suffering, and that probably doesn't always excite us, but there, it's a reality. So what do we need to remember about trials? What is it we need to remember so we can get through them during this life of ours? The first thing I would remind us of is this, that trials provide an opportunity to allow us to draw upon maximum, maximum power. In 1 Peter 4, verse 14, it says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. We could say it this way. We're never closer to God, uh, never more a recipient of his strength than when trials come upon us because what do we do in those moments? We cling to him. And we realize that we have something that others don't have. If you're in Christ, you've been given this gift called God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit in your life. And God's Spirit gives us so much strength and helps us in, in so many ways. And it kind of reminds me, when I think about this maximum strength that we can have in trials, it reminds me of a story that we find in, in Acts chapter 7 in the New Testament. Um, it's a story about Stephen. And if you know the story, Stephen is a man of faith. Uh, the gospel, the message of Jesus has just changed his life. And he's sharing uh, there that's recorded for us in Acts 7. He's telling the good news to others about Jesus and who he was and why he lived the way he did. He lived this perfect life and he gave up his life for you. He, he died for you and he's, he's doing his best to share Jesus with others, talking about his life, death, and resurrection, and all those things. And these people, uh-uh, they're not having any of it. There is no way. 
And they begin one by one picking up those stones, and they're ready to go ahead, and they're going to pelt this guy. They're going to stone him to death. And that's how he dies. But what happens before he dies, I think, is so amazing because it tells us that Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive, receive my spirit. But he went on and he said this, and Lord, do not hold the sin against these ones who are doing this. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> It's only through God's Spirit. It's only through maximizing that strength that we have available. So whoever you are today, if you're in Christ, when you're up against it in trials and struggles, you have what it takes. You have the power to endure and come through those times. We need to also remember during those times of trials that sometimes sometimes we get what we deserve. Okay, let me, let me read in verse 15. It says, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Um, if you are suffering because you've done something against the law, you've killed someone, you have stolen something, uh, no, this is not what God's talking about here. It's not about those kind of things. You don't do those things for the glory of God. That makes no sense. And so sometimes we get what we deserve. Sometimes we say we reap what we sow. I think it's interesting, though, in this passage that Peter goes so far to say even those people who meddle, who are meddlers. And I don't know what you think about when you think of a meddler. I think about a person who has their nose stuck in someone else's business. It's none of our business, and yet this is the kind of person who wants to meddle in that and kind of likes the drama, we might say. Well, when we do those kind of things, it can backfire on us. And all of a sudden, we no longer have a relationship with that person because we put our nose where it shouldn't have been. And so sometimes we get what we deserve. Peter wants us also to remember, in verse 16, he brings this out, most suffering should not in any way cause us to feel shame. He says it this way, however, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. I, I know people, and maybe you know people like this, because of where they work, um, and people around them know they're Christians. Um, they are persecuted in a sense. They are made fun of. They are disrespected. Um, they like to throw things at those people um, that really... You know, it's not easy to work in these workplaces, and probably you know of that person. And maybe it's you today uh, that you have to deal with that. It may, be, it may be happen to you, not at work, but maybe it's when you get together for um, holidays. Uh, maybe it's when the extended family gathers together, and maybe it's that uncle. Maybe it's a cousin you have. And you know before you get there, they're just going to let you have it about your faith in some way. Um, Peter is saying, when those times come... <laughs> Don't be ashamed of that. I mean, we are suffering like Christ suffered. There is a way of connecting with Christ, and this is something that we, um, we're, we're kind of honored by doing that. It's, it's great, I think, and I, I've known people this way that people around them know they're Christians, and because they, they're Christians, people around them change. They, they don't use the same vocabulary uh, about them, and so it's kind of an honoring thing uh, to see those kind of things happen, and even when we are um, being, we might say, persecuted in a sense. So we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We're, we're being honored just as Christ in, in, in the way that he dealt with things too. So we need to also remember this found in verse 17, verse uh, 17a. It says, uh, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. Suffering is usually timely and needed. <sighs> Maybe there's been a time in your life where you said, I I suffered during that period of time. I really went through something difficult, and it was really hard. Now, typically, this doesn't happen weeks later. (laughs) This may happen years later. But maybe enough years have gone by, and you have a perspective and say, you know, I really am glad I went through that. I couldn't have said it at the time, but I learned so much through that season in my life. I learned so much that year. I learned so much during that period. And so sometimes it's exactly (laughs) what we need to learn. I I want us to go on in this section where we see chapter 4, verse 17, and he goes on, and look at what Peter says next. He shares this. He says, and if it begins with us, referring to Christians, the family of God, if it begins with us, this thing of judgment, 
what will be the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what would become of the ungodly and the sinner? So if we're thinking we have it really hard because of suffering in some way, some trial that we have, if we think we have it really tough, it's in those moments we need to reflect. We need to think about, wow, I'm having it tough and I'm in Christ. I can't imagine how hard it's going to be for those people who don't have a relationship with God in their life when they have trials. Today, if you're in Christ, the times that we probably think about that most are at funerals. And we go to a funeral, we know this person wasn't a Christian, didn't have any faith in God at all. And we always say the same thing, it's different. It's different there than when we go to a funeral of someone we know who had a faith in Christ and lived as a, as a Christ follower. It's totally different. And so Peter wants us to remember, and I think this is a good time for us to pause and to think about those people we know who are not in Christ, that that's our job, that's our obligation, our duty, if you will, to, to share Christ with those people because we want to provide them hope, the same hope that we have that comes through Christ. And we many times say, I don't know how an unbeliever can get through this in, in, in life because they don't have what I have. And, and I think that is so hard for us. They don't have a Savior. They don't have absolutes. They don't have a foundation to lean upon. Um, they don't have anyone to turn to. And that should prompt us. That should prompt us. That hopelessness that they have, and maybe they don't even realize how hopeless it is, that should prompt us as Christians to share Christ with them. Now, I, I want to be real. There are things that happen to Christians that rock our worlds just like unbelievers. I mean, you name it. I, I, I've seen many people who are Christians, and, and when all of a sudden some catastrophe, something horrible happens to them personally or to their family member in their family, whatever. I mean, we cry, we weep, we go through just all of that like unbelievers. But the difference is we have someone that we lean on. We have a sovereign God that we hold and clingly, cling tightly to. Uh, we we uh, lean on him for help and hope and strength, and, and we have that in our life while others don't. I want us to remember one other thing. In the midst of trials, remember this. There's no comparison between what we suffer now and what the unrighteous will suffer later. We can get down about our sufferings that we're going through now. But again, comparing to that, to what those who don't know the Lord are going to suffer in the life after this life is over, there is no comparison. Um, imagine how horrible that will be. And again, as we think about that, may that prompt us, may it prompt our love within ourselves that I don't want that person to have to experience life after death in a bad way. I want them to experience what I'm going to experience and being in a perfect place and being in the presence of God in heaven. Peter then closes out this passage and he talks about this. He wants to encourage us, encourage us to continue on uh, relying upon God. And he says this, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That's easier said than done, isn't it? So when you are going through something in the future, or as you're going through something right now that's incredibly hard, and you don't understand why this is happening, you don't understand it makes no sense, then in the midst of all that, Peter is saying that we continue to do that which is good. And as we do that, we can be great witnesses for Christ. People will look at us and say, how, how, do you, how do you make it through this? It's because of God. It's because of my relationship with the Lord that I can get through this. And so we need to continue to keep doing good. Would you pray with me? Father, that is my prayer, that if we're in the midst of something hard right now in our lives, that we as Christians would continue to do good. God, I, I pray that we would not see trials and times of suffering as just totally horrible, bad, awful, and yet it's so hard because so many times they are so, um, so hurtful. Um, there is such a um, heaviness about them 
Um, there's something that just rips our hearts apart in many, uh, many occasions when we're going through uh, times of trials. And so, God, in the midst of those times, my prayer is that as we have to face those things, maybe in the future that we've never faced right now, that we'll remember what, what you have said to us through your word. God, that these things can help us, that they can help us to be mature and grow and persevere in all those things that you've told us. And God, as we go through those things, uh, may we be a, just a great, great witness for you. Father, I do want to pray today, too, that you would be with those that are, are listening and, and not in Christ, that they've never made a commitment to Jesus, that they would understand there's a, a desire that I have and others have that know them, uh, that they might give their lives to Christ and surrender their life and begin to be followers of Jesus uh, Father, we pray for those individuals today that need to make those decisions that they would respond to Jesus. God, we love you and thank you for giving us life and giving us hope and giving us an opportunity so that we can live with you someday in a glorious place called heaven. Thank you for the hope that you've given us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this morning's passage, we heard about what it means to bear the name of Christ. As we approach our time of communion this morning, I'd like for us to consider the Lord's Supper as an act of covenant renewal, where we remember and realign our identity and commitment to Christ. When Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper in Luke 22, he called the bread his body and he called the cup the new covenant in his blood. This new covenant that Jesus established with the disciples is in continuity with the old covenant that was established by Moses with the people of Israel. In using the language of blood sacrifice in that Luke 22 passage, Jesus recalls the old covenant and the blood of the bulls that was shed. But through the communion meal, Jesus establishes a covenant with his disciples through his own blood and invites them to live under his authority and reign. As followers of Christ, we're invited to do the same thing today. Every time we take communion, we declare that we are the people of God's covenant, that we bear his name, we bear the name of Christ. But we also admit that we need to be recalibrated to this identity. During the week, we may live as if we have forgotten our covenant relationship. We've forgotten our covenant identity with God. And so communion can provide an excellent opportunity for us to be reordered to his kingdom purposes. So as you take the elements in your homes this morning, thank Jesus for allowing you to bear his name as a Christian. And also ask him to reveal what parts of your life need to be realigned in your covenant relationship with him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for calling us to be in covenant with you and for sending your son Jesus to make that new covenant possible. Holy Spirit, we pray your blessing upon these elements and ask that you would use this time to calibrate our hearts toward the purposes of your kingdom. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All followers of Christ are now invited to partake of the elements in your homes and to celebrate the fellowship you have with Christ and with one another. Let's partake.
we are going to continue to worship our God by giving back to him what he has already provided to us. Each week, our giving goes to help support the ministry that takes place here at Chapel Hill, in our community, and around the world. This week, we heard from the Morse family, who serve as missionaries in Thailand. And like the churches in America, they're having to find new ways to support and minister to the people that they're around. They have seen more and more non-believers in this time become increasingly interested in God. They call the God of the Bible the God who cares. That is how he's being viewed around the world in this time. And so uh, many have been asking pastors in Thailand to conduct special prayer services for their families as well. And through our gifts, the Morses have been able to continue to minister and bless the people of Thailand in this time. Thank you so much for your giving to their ministry. You're now invited to give however you've been giving over the past few weeks and to join us as we sing these words together. Sing, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. This Thursday, May 7th, is our country's National Day of Prayer. We would love for you to join us for an online service this Thursday as, at 12 o'clock as we pray for our country. There has been no better time for believers to come together and lift up the needs of our nation, and we would love to have you join us. Over the past few weeks, we've been hearing from Josh about Vacation Bible School this summer. 
Check out this video from Josh for more details on what to expect. Are you ready for the most epic adventure ever? Next summer, Group VBS is taking kids on a ride they'll never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. Your church will be on track at Sing and Play Express. Get ready for high energy fun at Locomotion Games. Experience impactful Bible lessons and Bible adventures. You'll have amazing discoveries at Imagination Station. Take a glimpse into the world of five awesome kids who learned that Jesus' power pulls us through. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway. If you haven't jumped aboard the Rocky Railway, we're waiting for you. Go to our website, chapelhillcc.church slash VBS to register to serve in one of our many areas on the Rocky Railway. Thanks, Josh. For more information or to register, check out our website. Next Sunday, May 10th, is Mother's Day. We want to honor our mothers by putting together a slideshow and playing it before the service next week. We would encourage people of all ages to send in your pictures of you and your mother to be a part of the slideshow. Make sure you send in those pictures no later than May 6th to Rachel at rccore at chapelhillcc.church. Now as we go, may you keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and have a great week.